You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. The Gerald Hugo Agency. Mr. Hugo's in a meeting. May I take a message? The Gerald Hugo Agency. No, he's still in a meeting. Yes, the same writer. Please hold. Now get this, Mr. Hugo. If this one ain't sure fire, I'll, I'll cut off both my hands. You ready? Champion of the world. Robert Redford, maybe. Uh, Harrison Ford. You want to make him younger? I give you Adam Sandler. I appreciate it. So, he's champion of the world, but he promised his girl he'll never fight again. He, he made a vow. You, you know, Mr. Hugo, like, like a promise, real solemn. Here are the network contracts, Mr. Hugo. Thank you. But now, here comes the rub. Get this. The champion's kid brother has, like, this incurable disease that can't be cured, and he needs an operation, like yesterday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the doctor comes to the fighter, and he says, Hey, man, you want, like, your kid brother should live, or what? I mean, that's the conflict. Don't you think it's a kick right in the head? I do feel a dull ache. Here's this prize fighter who made his vow to the girl, and the newspaper guys start in on him, see? But, but I mean with a needle... Spider is a cheese champion. Who's Spider? The fighter. And now, here comes the meat. He promised his girl, but when he tells her he's gonna fight, she starts palpitating, and she calls him a filthy, rotten, dirty... Line one, Mr. Hugo. Excuse me, Julius. See, the beauty of the story is that you can dress it up any way you want. Maybe he ain't a prize fighter. Maybe he's a, a cowboy, and he and he promised his girl he'd never shoot a gun again, and, and, and it's her kid brother that's got the disease. <coughs> <clears throat> What's the matter? Don't that grab you? Why don't you go downstairs and cross the street on a red light? How about science fiction? There's this rocket man who promises his girl he'll never go up in a spaceship. Julius, you've been here all morning. I'll give you this. I've been an agent for 23 years, and I've never heard so many variations of the same story. Now, would you mind going home? I've got a big deal cooking here. A big deal? You doll baby, you. You were saving it for a surprise, weren't you? It's a sale, ain't it? The zombie story. I knew the minute I wrote it, that thing was surefire. Listen to this, honey. It's fantastic. This dame marries a guy who walks around on his heels all the time. She thinks he's punchy, but it turns out he's dead. All the time they're married, she don't know it. Julius, let me put it to you this way. American Zombie didn't sell. The love story where the lady scientist falls for a robot, that didn't sell. Naked Weapons about a gang of topless ninjas, that didn't sell. They laughed me right out of the office. So I put it to you, Julius. Why do you persist? Why don't you go back to doing what you did before? The uh, streetcar conductor, Mr. Hugo, there ain't no more streetcars. And besides, I get motion sickness. Let me put it to you another way. Number one, you will never make a writer. Number two, you'll starve to death if you try. And number three, you're wasting my time, the producer's time, and everybody's time. Helen, phone up Jerry Bradshaw at Paramount. Tell him I've got a series proposal to show him. That's it, a TV series. Oh, Mr. Hugo, don't you get it? This is an absolute bolt from heaven. I got so many television series ideas, I can't sleep at night. Boy meets girl. Every week, we get a different boy and a different girl. Julius! Oh, how about a quiz show? Pick your own and bomber, we'll call it. You make this deal with the contestant, that when he kicks off... Julius, what do I have to say to get you out of here? Give me a chance. It's all I ask. Let me write a pilot script. Julius, my boy, I'm not a hard man. The television industry today is looking for talent, and the writer is a major commodity. But for me, to try to sell you to a network is like trying to con the Queen of England into buying a salami. But I could give it a whirl, couldn't I? What's, what's the series about? Maybe it's right up my alley. That's the point. This particular series and you go together like the black and tan at an IRA picnic. 
It happens to be based on black magic, conjuring, that kind of thing. Now, what do you know about black magic? What do I know about it? What do I know? You ask me, Julius Mulmer, what he knows about black magic. <laughs> I could research it. Julius, let me get back to work now. What about the series, Mr. Hugo? Uh, my career is on the line. Give me till next Wednesday. Make it Tuesday in a pinch. All right, Julius. You latch onto a couple of books, knock out a rough outline, and let me have it by 4 o'clock Monday. I'll submit it for you. Why, I don't know, but I will. Mr. Hugo, you're not going to live to regret it, and I mean that from the cockles of my heart. You're absolutely dead right, Julius, and I mean that from the cockles of my heart. You've just witnessed opportunity, if not knocking, at least scratching plaintively on a closed door. Mr. Julius Moomer, a would-be writer who, if talent came 25 cents a pound, would be worth less than car fare. But in a moment, Mr. Moomer, through the offices of some black magic, is about to embark on a brand new career. And although he may never get a writing credit on The Twilight Zone, he will soon become an integral character in it. And now, back to The Twilight Zone and our story, The Bard, starring John Ratzenberger and Stacy Keach. Hello? Anybody here? Yes. Hey, what are you listening to? Ah, uh, the ball game. Oh, this is the Minor Arcana bookstore, right? Sure is. What'll it be? I have a special price on first edition Keats. Okay, show me a Keats. <laughs> That's a man's name, not a thing. And not a very uncommon name at that. There was a third baseman came up from Newark, played for the Yankees one year. They used to call him Beanball Keats. Yeah? Held the American record for getting bean the most times. One time they were playing the Browns. That was when St. Louis had the Browns, and he got bean three times the first five innings. Old Beanball Keats. <laughs> you learn something new every day. Ever hear of a pitcher named String Bean Slattery? Well, I... Now there was a beanball artist. He could hit a batter when he was still in the dugout. As a matter of fact, he did one day. <laughs> hit a third base coach, played for the A's. Fellow named Lefty Mahoney. Old Lefty was just taking a drink when String Bean wound up and tossed one at him right on the noggin. It seems there was a feud going on between them when they played for Binghamton in the old NYP League. Mahoney used to wipe the spit off String Bean's pitches. Mahoney was catching at the time. String Bean's father used to be an outfielder for Syracuse in the the International League. I don't need no book about baseball. You don't? Oh, how sad. It's a wonderful sport, you know. Uh, uh, where were we? I come in about... Well, what I had in mind was... Yeah? What do you got on black magic? Hmm. You have an interest in the black arts? You bet I do. See, I'm Julius Moomer from the television. Oh, I'm Sadie Polodny from Newark. I'm afraid I don't have very much on black magic. I have a great deal of information on the black socks, however. You probably know they threw the series that year. Terrible thing. Very discrediting to the game. And they could have taken the series four in a row, too. That's where that expression, say it ain't so, Joe, comes from. Um, now, what is it you wanted? Books. Black magic. Uh, I'm afraid that one eludes me, but I'll tell you something. If I could exercise a little magic, I'd see what I could do about getting the New York Giants back. Hey, look out! Don't worry, that shelf will stand anything. I'll get it for you. Now, isn't that strange? It's one single book. That's the only thing that fell off that shelf. And it fell right in front of me. Which one is it? The Book of the Black Arts. What do you know about that? Lady, can you do that trick again? Well, this book and I have never been formally introduced. We are total strangers. Here, you want black magic? You got it. Maybe it's some kind of sign. Well, if it is, it's your problem now. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure meeting you, having this chat. Uh, mutual. You didn't happen to play third base for the Elmira Pioneers one year, did you? Uh, how much I owe you for the book? Ah, uh, nothing. Accept it as a gift. You're a wonderful ball player and a credit to the sport. It's been great. Now, Bye. Make the sign of the pentagram and repeat three times. Let's see if I have this right here. In the name of the Prince of Darkness and a Black Sabbath, Beelzebub, Beetlejuice, Asmodeus of Astrogoth, Ozzy of Osborne. I can't say all that. Zaza zoom, ba ba boom, ipsy dipsy, ba ba boom. 
Hey, none of that on this bus. What? All right, buddy. This here is public transportation, and there's rules. Do you mean me, driver? Yeah, you. I don't need no crazies on my bus. But I was only... Out. Hey, you don't have to throw my book. It's a very valuable tome there. I never touched it. It got off with you. But I left it on the back seat there. Get out of here. Huh. What do you know? Just like a puppy dog that follows you around. <laughs> Looks like this little book in me. We got a thing going on. Seven times seven be thy number, but six, six, six be thy fate. <laughs> yeah, right. It's all this mumbo jumbo anyway. What's going on here, Jack? Not a thing, officer. I was just reading. Yeah? Well, do me a favor, will you, bud? Read someplace else. What's the matter? There's a log and sitting on a bench in Central Park with literature? There is if you make my horse nervous. He knows when somebody's up to something. He's got instincts. So whatever it is, do it someplace else. I don't get it. On account of why? Move it! Cuss it. Stormtrooper. <laughs> There. All right. Now I gotta draw a symbol in this here scene. Hey, Julius. What's the bit? What are you doing? Whatever it is, I wasn't doing it right. <laughs> ah, magic, magic. There's more here than meets the eyeballs. I've done everything it said, and nothing. Ye book of the black art, being a step-by-step -step education in conjuring. So tell me, Faust, to what end? You don't dig? Cora, I'm standing on a threshold. I mean, hovering. The only thing that stands between me and the secrets of the universe is four pages of Latin. Listen to this. The black art, consisting of necromancy, turgy, demonology, divilment, hoodoo, voodoo, conjuration, enchantment, spiritualism, manifestation, materialization, astro body, and ectoplasm, mesmerizing, magnetizing, and fascinating. <laughs> like you name it. I got it. My mother isn't gonna like that sand all over the floor. Yeah, you tell your mother she should pay me for the privilege of having me in this building. Yeah, you may also tell her that out of 10,000 riders in this town, they pick the absolute cream of the crop. And who's that? Who do they choose to write a big time television series of black magic? Modesty prohibits. <sighs> Not Julius Moomer. In the flesh. Big deal. Go ahead and scoff. But one of these days, you're gonna scoff on the other side of your mouth, Tootsie. There's gonna be a big, long limousine parked down below with two Lazarian coachmen. Liveried. Huh? Yeah, that's what I mean. In uniform. And they're gonna rap on your door and invite you and your old lady downstairs for a night on the town with their boss. And who will you find in a back seat smoking a Cuban cigar? Modesty prohibits. Uh, just as a point of interest, Julius, what are you doing? I'm conjuring, baby. Conjuring. Conjuring who? Who knows? I just read from this here book and I got all the ingredients. Well, most of them, anyhow. Three tufts of feathers from a falcon. Yeah, I got them from a pigeon. Sand from Egypt. Yeah, I got some of my sneakers from Jones Beach. Three legs of a spider. And I found me an ant. Well, anyway, what with a few improvisations, I got a spell working here. At least I think I do. When my mother finds out what you're doing to the floor, you better conjure up the Marines. You're gonna need them. Anybody ever tell you you're a dirty, rotten teenager? Why don't you go and take a cold shower? Go ahead, get out or I'll turn you into a frog. Man, I don't know what's supposed to happen, but it better happen soon. Za za zoom. Ali kazam. Uh, va va voom. Nothing. Zizam. Uh, ipsy dipsy. Kaka zoom. I need some help. By Monday, eh? <laughs> Who do they think I am? Shakespeare? You called? <gasps> Where did you come from? You summoned me, good sir. I did? Who are you? The face is sort of familiar, but it, hey, don't take this personal, pal. Like a guy should knock when he comes into a room, especially wearing tights and a collar like that. Hey, you know, maybe down in the village, but not around here. Some folks take one look at you and have a coronary. Now me, I can handle this stuff. I'm hip, you know? 
Splendid. I'm pleased to hear it. Who would you say you are? William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon in the flesh. William Shakespeare... Good sir, I await your pleasure. What do you want from me already? Prithee, good sir, ask not what I want of thee, but rather what dost thou ask of the Bard of Avon? Would you try that one more time? It seems I must speak in the parlance of the time. Your time. I simply said, good sir, it was you who conjured me up, and I'm at your service. What would you ask of me? On a level, Pops. Do you mean to say you're the Shakespeare? Man, you've been dead a thousand years. Tis true, of course, but death be not proud. You require a service of me, hence I am at your disposal. Well, I... Uh... He speaks, yet he says nothing. Romeo and Juliet, Act Two, Scene Two. Quaint surroundings, decidedly so. If squalid. And this, an ancient printing device, perhaps? Yeah, that's, uh, that's my Underwood typewriter. I, I inherited it from my old man. He, he used to write letters on it. You would ask me to compose a sonnet, perchance, a play? You have but to ask, Mr. Um, Moomer, is it? You mean you could knock me out a couple of pieces? Good sir, you have but to ask. What nature of authorship would you require? Oh, I got me an idea, Will. You don't mind me calling you Will, do you? What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Man, what language! Hey, Will, don't let anybody knock your stuff. You've got potential. But here's what we'll do. You and me will collaborate. You knock out the rough draft, and I'll do the polish. Yeah. We'll start out slow, see? Just to get the feel. Something with star power, you know, like uh, for Julia Roberts. Julia? Never heard of her? <laughs> Where you been, pal? Eh, never mind. Don't tell me. A comely woman, I take it. One fairer than my love. The old seeing sun ne'er saw her match since first the world begun. Solid! I love it! Now you start right. Anything. Uh, maybe a twist on the old Romeo and Juliet thing. You know, like uh, West Side Story. Oh, swear not by the moon, that crazy, crazy mood. Yeah, take it, booby. Right. If you don't object, I prefer my own writing instrument. A feather, huh? A quill pen, actually. Will, baby, I don't care if you write with your feet. Go, man, go. Create. I'll just make us some coffee. Gilbert and Sullivan, Rimsky and Corsico, Lennon and McCartney, Moomer and Shakespeare. <laughs> I like it. What are they saying? I presume they're talking about your script. That's the point, honey. What else is there to talk about? The, the, the stuff is poetry. I don't mean if... You can keep your head when all about you, kind of guff. This here is class. It's, it's, well, it's downright Shakespearean. Is Mr. Blumberg in there with Mr. Hugo? We're from the network. They're expecting you, sir. Go right in. Blumberg? The big shot producer? The two guys from the network? <laughs> it's a shoo-in for the Emmy. Just a little something I knocked off for a couple hours. You know, I, I didn't know it was that good, but that's me, honey. Never did know my own worth. I mean, Monday I knock myself, Tuesday I knock myself, Wednesday... Have you got any openings for Thursday? I'd like to make an application. I'm Mr. Dolan. This is Mr. Nolan. We're from the ad agency. Go right in, sir. They're expecting you. Come in, gentlemen. What were you saying, Mr. Bloomberg? I don't know. That's our feeling, too, Mr. Blumberg. Our take, too. Sponsor-wise, the thing requires some noodling. Now, that is, we can't afford to jump off a bridge with this one. I concur. It's so archaic. I mean, language-wise... Well, it's still rough. Uh, fresh as a bridegroom and his chin new reaped, showed like a stubble land at harvest home, he was perfumed like a milliner, and twixt his finger and his thumb he held a poncet box... Which ever and anon he gave his nose and took it away again. 
Well, you gotta say this, Ford, it has imagery. Right, Mr. Blumberg, imagery it has. I was going to comment, uh, the thing did possess uh, at least a, a, a modicum of imagery. Uh, right, Nolan? I concur. Uh, what's the time slot? Yes, uh, what about the time slot? Uh, Thursday, 10 to 11. And what's the lead-in? The Indefatigables. Solid show. The private eye with insomnia never sleeps. Ratings-wise, it's a solid smash. Uh, may I? Please. And if the boy have not a woman's gift to rain a shower of commanded tears, an onion will do well for such a shift. Onion? Hmm, could be a sponsor conflict. I concur. Could we make it, um, uh, turnip? Solid thinking. Everybody knows about turnips. You say turnip to the lady in Dubuque, she's with you. I like it. A shower of commanded tears. Shower. Hmm. Suggest inclement weather. And people don't shop in inclement weather. Make it... Make it... A sunshine of commanded tears. Solid. I concur. I think we could call the writer in now. A tremendous talent. Prodigy of mine. What are his credits? He was a streetcar conductor, an observer of the passing scene, an incredible judge of human beings. You can see that in every line. A modern-day chronicler of human foibles. Solid. But send in Mr. Mook. How are you, Mr. Hugo? Gentlemen, well, what do you think? Like, uh, literature, huh? That shows some promise. Mr. Dolan here represents a sponsor of the Shannon Classic Playhouse. The Shannon Food Corporation. You no doubt have eaten their products. Oh, endlessly. This boy is a, a Shannon booster from way back. Oh, man, that's the truth. That Shannon's onion soup? This, I dig. We don't make onion soup. That's French in origin. We're an American firm. Red, white, and blue right down the line. I concur. Man, I'm glad you said that, because I always say... If it's good enough for the lady in Dubuque, it's good enough for me. <clears throat> now, let's get down to some business here. The Tragic Cycle. Written by Julius Moomer. Act 1, Scene 1. The camera fades in on a shot of the garden. You know, like with turnips. Right, is to stay in there and keep punching. It's like Keith said one time. All the time, keep punching, or you're done for. Hey, how about that, Will? Taped this show last night, you like it? Verily, a most impressive performance. Ain't that the truth? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's interview. Our guest tonight, Mr. Julius Moomer, that rising young author whose tragic cycle will be seen next week on this network's Shannon Classic Playhouse. Mr. Moomer, I'm told you've been writing for some time. You've come a long way. Yeah, it's like progress. Wasn't one of your early works in the horror genre a story about a zombie? Yeah, how about that? The fellow with the heart that don't even beat. Can he find love anyway? It was a little too controversial. <laughs> That's why it didn't get on the air, you know. But I'm always trying to tackle controversial stuff, you know, pushing the old envelope. What about your TV pilot script, Mr. Moomer? A situation comedy involving a billionaire. Just plain Trump. <laughs> yeah. The whole thing there was, we're always seeing stuff about typical guys and their typical wives and kids, you know? Well, what about the big shots? I mean, like what they call the rubber barons. Just because you're healed, that don't make you inhuman. Some great stuff in there. The, the idea was, can a fellow who makes nine million bucks a day find happiness in a small mansion? I mean, he's entitled. Of course, a writer, no, yeah, he's got to suffer. Like, I remember sitting in that cold attic night after night with hardly enough strength left to dictate, and some little voice inside me always kept saying, go, Julius, go, go, Julius. So, I went. Truly inspiring, Mr. Moomer. That kind of got me. Right here. I too felt a twinge of a sort. I believe I've finished this last sequence, Mr. Moomer. Yeah? Let me see. Uh-huh. 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 You know something, Will? You, you got a real thing with words. It comes from working in an attic, Mr. Moomer. A little voice deep inside me keeps saying, Go, William, go. I like that. A anyway, can't you just see it? The, the, the Shannon Food Corporation. Ta-da! Presents the tragic cycle written by... Ta-da! Julius Moomer. From an original story by Julius Moomer. Additional dialogue by Julius Moomer. 
Lucky I'm so modest. A thing like this could go to a guy's head. We're already talking another miniseries. Movie contracts, even. Maybe a Broadway musical. Well, you, you don't look so good. Like a strutting player whose conceit lies in his hamstring. That's from Troilus and Cressida, Act 1, Scene 3. In short, Mr. Moma, you have not been prone to extend credit where it is due. At no time, for example, have I heard the name Shakespeare, or for that matter, any suggestion of collaboration on our play. Well, baby, we gotta play this one by ear. I'd tell him a guy named Shakespeare helped me write this, they'd stick me in a straitjacket. Be that as it may, the point is, Mr. Moomer, I have finished my task. I will now take my leave. What, are you out of your mind? This whole thing is coming on velvet. You, you want to creep back in some crypt and get, get forgotten? Come on, man, you're big time now. I'm, I'm making you a household word all over again. With all due modesty, would the name of William Shakespeare have survived the test of time without the support of Julius Moomer? Yeah, but fame flits. Who remembers yesterday's champions? Sure, Ruth hit a lot of home runs. But who asked him for his autograph now? Nobody. Nijinsky? That's pretty good. But who remembers her last movie? You did some right. But out of sight, out of mind. Shakespeare's dead. Long live Mickey Spillane. Get me? My good man. You can't desert the ship. Now, what are people going to say? That Fink who didn't have no gratitude? We got projects to do. Go out to Hollywood, eh? The babes go crazy for guys with beards. I shall ponder it, Mr. Mooma. Till when? Till the morrow. Uh, to date, you have not seen fit to invite me to any rehearsals. Tomorrow I shall survey the actors performing in it, and if justice is done to what I have wrought, perhaps I shall remain for a time longer. Now you're talking. Now I shall take a walk. I am that merry wanderer of the night, Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 2, Scene 1. To be or not to be, Mr. Mooma, that is the question. Oh, wait a minute. Rehearsal? How can he go to the rehearsal? Will, Will, do me a favor, please. Don't rock the boat. Comfortable, Mr. Shannon? Well... These seats are kind of hard on the old derriere. Mr. Shannon, before we begin the rehearsal, I'd like to say we're fortunate, sir, to have secured the services of the hottest young actor in the business, Rocky Rhodes. Rhodes? Schmodes. I sell soup. Which one is he? Oh, uh, the attractive one in the T-shirt and the motorcycle boots. All right, people, we'll pick it up with scene two, act two. Now, Felicia, remember that at this moment, life and death await you in the hallway, and when Rocky comes through that door... Uh, uh, I, I got a question. Yes, Rocky. I mean, like, what's the tertiary motivation? Like, when I open the door, like, why? Why, Rocky? Exactly. Like, any slob can walk in the door, but he, he could do it any time. But I ask myself, would I walk through that door? How come? I got to find my motivation. So the question is, where is my motivation? Well, I'd say you walk through the door to get inside. That work for you? Yeah. Wow. Great. Uh, let's run through this and uh, see how it plays. Shall we do that? All right, people. Come on, folks. From the top. I don't care what you say. If Jeremy comes here tonight, I have to go away with him. Oh, come, Olivia. Cast off those benighted colors of Benetton and gaze as a friend on the people of Greenwich Village. The village people? Here? She's got a point. Let not forever with your veiled eyes seek your noble boyfriend in the dust motes. I know it is common, but all that live must die. That's easy for you to say, sister. But outside this room, this tenement is a harbinger of the worst kind of fates. Is it Jeremy? Or his killer? Am I to be a correspondent of love? Or a recipient of hate? This is the real question, the biggie. Who awaits me out there, I ask you? Come on, cop out! I'm looking for Mr. Mooma. Shh! Quiet on the set! Now may we continue, people, once more, and get ready for your cue, Rocky. I don't Sit care Sit down, what Will! You say. How does it look to you, Mr. Jeremy Shannon? Only great. What about the commercial? Where does that come in? Right after the opening teaser. Are they gonna put a spotlight on the soup? Well, that comes in the first commercial. I know when that comes in, but I want to make sure you see the label. 
When the soup is Shannon's, I want 40 million people should know it's Shannon's. I concur. It's imperative that we see the label. Cut! Take five. Who is that? What's he dressed up for? Oh, that's my, uh, that's my typist. On your staff, is he, Moomer? Well, actually, he's a relative. On my mother's side, he's, uh, eccentric. Eccentric? You know, uh, he has, like, uh, delusions. One week they come, one week they go. What about this week? Yeah, this week he thinks he's, uh, Shakespeare. <laughs> hey, uh, come on over here, Mr. S. Meet the boys. I've been telling them all about you. What did we have this much space at the Globe? Yeah, they're just going over the second act. Ah, the balcony scene, the most delightful love sequence. On a balcony yet? Uh, yeah, I was going to mention it to you, Will. Uh, Mr. Shannon asked us to make a little change in the love story part. You know, the business on a balcony. A thing of beauty. Oh, spirit of love, how quick and fresh art thou. Who owns balconies these days? Tremendously valid point, Mr. Shannon. No question about it. Right on down the line. You mean no balcony? You see, this here is television. It's like uh, you gotta grab them quick. Instead of the boy climbing up to the shrubbery to meet the girl, it's a subway station. You jest. That's the bit. She sprains her ankle, and this here boy kind of like the doc on ER. He operates on her ankle right there be- between the Brighton Express and the Bronx Local. You see, doctor's stories are big this season. All right, cast. I, I want to run through the next scene. Uh, Mr. Moomar. What's the trouble, Will? Is that Esmeralda in the blue canvas breeches? The jeans? Yeah, that's the chick. But if what you told me is true, what is the reason for her suicide? Her soliloquy about love's labor's lost? Suicide? No suicide, Mr. Shannon. That's definitely out. Oh, I meant to mention that to you, Will. She don't stick herself with a shiv. Now she runs off with a guitar player. <laughs> that was my wife's suggestion. And an inspired one at that. It was indeed. I concur. And the father and brother who burst in? Eh, my wife didn't care for that. The way we play it now, the two guys who come in are cops. Cops? Policemen. And then later, the, the scene where the mother starts talking about all the blood on her hands, uh, she ain't the mother anymore. She's the gardener's wife who did time for embezzlement. But she has the most definitive line of the play. In the epilogue, I took it from Twelfth Night, if music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it, that surfeiting the appetite may sicken and so die. Sicken? The Shannon Food Company is paying this kind of money to make people sick? Will, get with it. You're taking a butter right off the toast, baby. Here we go, people. Uh, let's hear the narration just for the timing. <clears throat> On October 13th, the gardener's wife returned to the scene of the crime. The police had already arrived, and once again, the Federal Bureau of Investigation... Enough of this idiocy. There is no soliloquy here. What is going on? Blow, blow, thou winter wind. Thou art not so unkind as man's ingratitude. As you like it, Act 2, Scene 7. Well, what are you doing? You're rousing up the whole deal. What am I going to tell them? Tell them that foolery, sir, does walk about the orb like the sun. It shines everywhere. Act 3, Scene 1, Twelfth Night. And you, foolish mortal, who could have covered himself with a cloak of immortality, who has succumbed to the rankest compound of villainous smell that ever offended nostril. To you, Julius Moomer, lots of luck. Hey, Julius, for a week now you look like somebody told you to go out and scrub a lizard. He finked out. The guy finked out. You want some advice? Knock off on the conjuring. Get yourself a nice, clean, safe job on a streetcar. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles, did that boy have talent or what? Man, oh man, I was on my way. They was already talking about my next assignment, a miniseries on American history. What do you know about American history? Eeny, meeny, chilly, beeny, the spirits are about to appear. Ma, he's doing it again. I'm sorry, Mr. Bloomberg, but writers are temperamental. No, he didn't care about the reviews. As I recall, he said something about foolery walking around the orb like the sun. Who knows what it means? The American history thing? Frankly, Mr. Bloomberg, I haven't been able to reach him. Mr. Hugo, he's outside. Who is? Julius, he's got some people with him. 
Mr. Bloomberg, he's here. The boy has come back into the fold. I knew we could count on Moomer. I'll get right back to you. Hey, Mr. Hugo. Julius, my boy, where have you been? A whole week. The networks are screaming for you. The agencies are screaming. My clients are screaming. They want that new miniseries. I'm right in the middle of it. Me and my staff been working night and day. Not that person in the knee breeches. Don't worry about him. He's out. This one's about American history, right? Right. You want authentic, right? Authentic above all. Then I'd like you to meet my staff. Send them in, will ya? General Robert E. Lee. General Ulysses S. Grant. George Washington. Abe Lincoln. And the little lady here is Pocahontas. In the flesh. Mr. Julius Moomer, a streetcar conductor filled with desire for the special, if somewhat risky, rewards of authorship. And if the tale just told seems a bit tall, remember a thing known as poetic license in a place called the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. The Bard, starring John Ratzenberger with Stacey Keach as Shakespeare and your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Susan Hart, Jessica Schramm, Meg Falcon, Lynn Foley, Mike Baccarella, Doug James, Jeff Lupiton, Joe Forbrick, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Paul Patch. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. 